So what's new in CLL at ASCO and IHA that we've heard this, uh, this year? Well, it's, it's more um, uh, explosions in terms of new drugs uh, available in CLL, which is, of course, very good news for our patients. What I think most of us find very exciting about CLL is that the new compounds that we've been hearing about that are going further into clinical development are all based upon an understanding of the biology of the disease. Therefore, we've got therapies that really target the disease and we can start to think about the ways in which we may be able to put those together. So what are, what are those compounds? So obviously, uh, a lot of excitement about uh, brutinib, idolelacib and ABT199 targeting different uh, pathways that are important within the CLL. Um, for brutinib, of course, well, the drug's already approved um, for refractory CLL in the US with uh, EMEA approval expected um, uh, in the very near future. What's been presented at these meetings are the results of the Resonate trial, which is a randomized trial, and the first randomized trial that we've had with ibrutinib, that compared um, uh, ibrutinib at a dose of 420 milligrams a day taken as a tablet uh, versus um, ofatumumab, an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. Unlike some of the other studies that have compared, had other comparators, here the drug was compared to an antibody which of course is approved for the use of relapsed and refractory CLL. Um, both at ASCO and at EHA, um, in parallel with the paper just appearing online at the New England Journal, means that we've got access to the whole clinical data on that uh, trial, demonstrating uh, very excitingly that the uh, overall response rate was very high um, and the progression-free survival very significantly improved for patients on ibrutinib compared to uh, those on um, ofatumumab. The other thing we've got from that study, of course, is that there have been some questions about, you know, um, ibrutinib looked as if it had a very good safety profile, but there were some questions in terms of what happens to relapsed and refractory CLL patients. And by having a comparative arm, we can see that many of the potential side effects were probably more related to the disease population rather than be anything to do with the drug because we're really not seeing very much in the way of a toxicity signal. We've also seen um, updates on the data um, on uh, idolelacib. Uh, again, here, a combination study of idolelacib plus rituximab versus rituximab monotherapy. That study came in for some criticism in terms of what the comparative arm was about just being rituximab. We're seeing here at the meeting, Steve Coutre is presenting an update on the data recently published in the New England Journal, showing that on further follow-up, uh, the, the progression-free survival advantages is, is, are remaining. And what we're also interested to see, because on neither the abrutinib nor the idolelacib, do we have very long-term follow-up yet, for us to be able to say what happens to patients who are on the drug for a longer period of time. What we've heard here at this meeting is that on the second interim analysis, we're not seeing any different um, toxicity signal, but still seeing ongoing responses. And then the last compound we find very interesting, ABT199, which targets a different pathway, targets the BCL2 pathway. And what we've seen here is an update of the ABT199 data alone, presented by John Seymour, but also the first look at the combination of ABT199 in combination with uh, abinutuzumab or GA101. What's exciting there is that we are looking as if we are seeing patients having very deep responses and even MRD negative responses with ABT and GA101. Now, why is that important? Well, that means there's the possibility we may be able to stop that therapy and, and it be defined. The huge problem we're going to face, probably particularly in Europe, is that with both ibrutinib and idolelacib, patients have to remain in those therapies very long term. The agents are very expensive and an indefinite treatment of these very expensive drugs is going to be very difficult for the managed healthcare systems in Europe to cope with. So what we're looking for and what we may be seeing with ABT199 is that you'll be able to use these types of therapies that are very easy for the patients to tolerate, but for a defined period of time and therefore a defined cost per patient. That's what we're all waiting to see the follow-up on. There has been some data emerging about the mechanisms of resistance that can emerge with ibrutinib. Um, certainly it's been described now that there are patients in whom there's a mutation that occurs in the binding pocket. Um, ibrutinib works by binding in a groove which is within the BTK molecule, 
if a mutation occurs within that, that groove, the molecule doesn't bind. It's, it's interesting um, and certainly um, almost could have been expected on the basis of what we've seen with imatinib in the treatment of CML. Um, but it remains to be true that we've investigated in detail some of those patients who've become resistant. The, however, the exciting news about ibrutinib is that not that many patients are becoming resistant. Obviously, we'll have to follow up over time. One concern would be that if you start thinking about, well, if mechanisms of resistance occur, you're going to have to start thinking about combinations. If we're already thinking that ibrutinib itself is very expensive, can we afford indefinite combinations of drugs? So that's going to be a real challenge for us.